everyone. I'm Jensine Bard, and welcome to Testimony, where truth is told, lives are changed, and hope is given. Revelation 12:11 tells us that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, a testimony of your story for His glory. She's the 42nd Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Virginia, elected to office in 2021 for a four-year term that began in 2022. That, but for the grace of God, a prophetic word, prayer, lots of hard work, support of family, friends, campaign team, and volunteers may never have come into being. But that's not all, as you will soon hear. This woman of firsts was about to make history in her endeavor to answer God's call and against all odds. Here to share this and more from her recently released memoir, How Sweet It Is, Defending the American Dream, is its author, United States Marine Corps veteran, successful business owner, entrepreneur, wife, mother, grandmother, and most important of all, lover of Jesus, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for whom her book is dedicated in part, and so much more, which we will talk about today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a high honor indeed, the Honorable Lieutenant Governor Winsome Earl Sears. Lieutenant Governor Winsome, if I may, welcome to Testimony. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And a good afternoon, good evening, wherever your listeners are, to them. Well, they are all listening, and it's great to have you. Before we begin to delve into your wonderful memoir, I have to say that if I am ever in your hometown of Kingston, Jamaica, I am coming straight to your home for some of that authentic Jamaican cuisine you so vividly described, not to mention experiencing (laughs) the rich heritage of culture, respect for elders, community, and education that once was idyllic before socialism ravaged the island, which you mentioned in your latest great read, How Sweet It Is, and what we in America today are fighting to overcome with the current administration. That said, you are a woman of many firsts, namely the first female lieutenant governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, elected for a four-year term beginning 2022, the first black female elected to statewide office, the first to be elected to a majority black house of delegates district, a first for a Republican in Virginia since 1865, add to this a veteran and an immigrant who set foot on U.S. soil at the tender age of six, and the rest, as they say, is history, which we will talk about today. First question. Yes, ma'am. Tell tell us about your growing up years, your segue into the military. You pack an M-16 and was trained as an electrician, successful business and political career, and just how, Winsome Earl Sears, you came to faith in Jesus Christ through it all. Oh boy, that's a whole lot. I tell you, they're going to have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and and by the way, the audio version, I'm the one who narrates it. So what you'll get is the emotions, you know, the the stops and starts and uh, you, you'll hear some things just because it's my life story. And of course, in various parts, it gets sad and some parts are happy, of course, but uh, just to, to your question, goodness, where do I start? So, uh, well, I could say that everything really started when my dad brought me to America, the, the American part of my life anyway, and that began when I was six years old, and it was a real tug of war, you know, because I am my mom's only child, and uh, and she would have to let me go, and uh, she was afraid that she would never see me again, and, and that even if I returned, that I wouldn't remember her as being my mother But, you know, um, thankfully, my great-grandmother, her grandmother, told her that I would never forget her and and that uh, 
she said, let me go because America, even back then, as people say, uh, was and still is the land of opportunity. You know, my dad came to America August 11th of 1963. Now, that date is important because just 17 days later, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. And so my father decided that this, even though it was the height of the civil rights movement, when there was, you know, uh, re- there were real dog whistles and, and hoses and such, he decided that America was still the best place for him as a black man to come. But think about it. America, even at that time, allowed a black man to enter. So, you know, uh, there are people who say that America, you know, is racist, et cetera, et cetera. And yet they allowed my dad to come. And yet my father still believed America was where he could get a second chance at life. So and then he brought me. So uh, we, we can't we, we can't uh, always say that things are always going to be right in this world. We know they're not going to be. As long as there's sin, it's not going to be. But this, as we always say with America, is the best place to be. And you know who knows that still? It's the people who, at the border who are literally throwing their children over the wall for them to start their American dream. Now, I don't agree with it. I say we have to know who's coming in the country. And, you know, we are a country of laws, etc. But they're telling us that they believe in the American dream, you see. Amen and amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Lieutenant Governor Winsome Earl Sears of the great state of Virginia on her latest great read, How Sweet It Is Defending the American Dream. I know I gave you a power-packed question up front. Let's break it down just a little bit for our listening audience. You were at death's door and very sickly as a child with doctors Mm -hmm. having no clue and no cure until one day through your paternal grandmother who you say, quote, loved you fiercely, end quote, and not one to give up, found a, quote, woman, a, quote, spiritual prophet who came to the rescue. And here Mm -hmm. you are today. Can you expound? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, my mother would tell me about this, you know, that um, uh, they had taken me to every doctor they could find. And I was just not I, I, I was really dying, and they could not figure out why I wasn't eating. I was losing weight, um, and as a six-month-old baby, you know, that's just, it really is a, a death door. And so they were just flush out of options, but they were praying people. And my great-grandmother, actually, on my goodness, I keep talking about my grandmothers and great-grandmothers, but, uh, you know, uh, she was a, a real, we would call a prophet. Uh, she she loved the Lord and 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 uh, brought her children to Christ and and um, her, she raised her daughter that way and her daughter became my paternal grandmother and and it was my paternal grandmother that said you know we've got to uh, we've got to talk to the Lord about it and so she she found a Christian woman and uh, this woman prayed and the the Lord uh, gave her. We believe the right answer, and sure enough, I uh, told her to go pick a bush. It sort of reminds me, uh, who was the king again in, in the Bible? Who Was it Elisha or Elijah was on his death? Elisha was on his deathbed, I believe, and told to go pick a bomb, and, and yes, and, and, uh, and there it was, healed the king. So I was healed as a result of uh, this woman getting that prophetic word, and here I am today. I can see how the enemy targeted you at a very young age uh, with your recounting that story. Um, You do give honor to your parents, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, namely Alberta, who said to your mother, quote, there's going to be a tug of war for this child, end quote. What did she mean by that, and how were you affected, if at all? You know, it's so wonderful to be loved and to be so loved that it, it creates a tug of war. And uh, my, so Alberta is my grandmother on my mother's side. And my, my father's mother, Valda, you know, always came to get me uh, because my mom would go off to work. And, and uh, so she would come to my mother's family and pick me up and, and take me to be with her. And then my mother would come home, she said, and I was not there. And so uh, she would have to go to 
my grandmother followed us home to come and pick me up. And it was just this constant, you know, of wh- who has the baby today sort of a thing. And, and so finally, my uh, grandmother, great-grandmother, Alberta, just decided that the best thing to do was to have my father's side of the family keep me because they had more resources. And so that's what happened. But that was the tug of war. And, um, and, and as I said, it's just so wonderful to be loved that both sides are fighting for you. <laughs> amen and amen. Again, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, Winsome Earl Sears, in her latest must read, How Sweet It Is Winsome. How did you get your name, Winsome? Yes. So my mother, it's an old English name, and I've only ever met uh, people who still have that modern colonial ties, as you might say, to England with it. Uh, I met a white woman about 90 plus years old, and her name, she was, of course, from England, and, and, and her name was Winsome. But so Winsome is known in the Caribbean. Generally, it's, it's more Jamaican in nature now. Uh, but uh, my mother's best friend, was uh, named Winsome, and so she decided, hmm, uh, let's give it to her. So it's it's known in Jamaica. It's not very common, but it's known. It's known. And, of course, my, my mother's uh, best friend, she was of uh, Indian heritage, Indian from India. Uh, as you know, wherever the British went, they people followed, and so Jamaicans are comprised of Indians and Chinese and, and uh, Arabs, too, uh, and uh, Black. And of course, you know, whites and most of the whites actually who came to Jamaica came from Ireland. So I even have Irish in my family. So oh. it's it's um, our motto back there is it's uh, out of many, one people. Wow. Well, that's what you would call a, quote, mixed bag, perhaps. But it's a <laughs> great mixed bag. And you're a great representative uh, of all of that. Next question, Dr. Alvita C. King, niece of slain civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., is a dear friend and multiple testimony guest, and her uncle, fondly known as MLK, you speak about in your book. Uh, in fact, you had the chore as a child of making sure his photo and frame was dust free and treated with honor. Can you talk about that and the impact his life had on yours as a young child and now? In the midst of worldwide divide, wars, rumors of wars, and the, quote, end of day seeming nearer by the day, your thoughts on achieving the, quote, peace, MLK sought to peacefully achieve, or has all of that been lost to Marxist, communist, opportunists in sheep's clothing? Your thoughts? Well, you know, uh, being uh, the youngest one, Everybody has had a job to do. Uh, everybody had a chore. And my chore was to dust. And, and the, so I always had to make sure that Dr. King's frame, photo and the, the whole frame was dust free. You know, we had to go around and do that. And he, he is so much a part of my life because, in fact, I met his widow, Coretta Scott King, when I was first elected when uh in 2001 and uh, when she came to richmond as we were going to plant a tree in honor of her husband and then just uh what 20 years later when when i was in the throes of my election for lieutenant governor i found myself at uh holly knoll which is in gloucester here in virginia and that was where dr king wrote his I have a dream speech, and I, I just found that so interesting. You know, he's just so entw- entwined with my life. And in fact, Dr. King came to Jamaica in 1965, and he said that. And I'm going to quote: "In Jamaica, I feel like a human being." And he came to talk about so very many things um, in in 1965 when he was entertained. Uh, brought down to Jamaica by the University of the West Indies. And, 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 and so I just believe that he was really speaking for so many people that he wanted his children and, of course, everyone else to be judged by the contents of their character because 
you know, racism, it's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. Amen. And so we all can be guilty of it. Uh, you know, we, you keep hearing about white supremacists, et cetera, but there are black supremacists too. There are all kinds of supremacists. So we just need to really pray for each other so that we can live in peace. And I believe you had asked about uh, the communism that came to Jamaica. Is that right? The socialism under one particular man. Yes, yes. So, so we had a prime minister who came to power and and he declared that Jamaica was now a democrat, uh, socialist country. Where have we heard that before? Ah, yes. Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. She said that, that uh, that's what she was. And folks, it doesn't work. His, uh, this, this prime minister's ideas destroyed Jamaica economically, destroyed Jamaica in every which way. Uh, he nationalized everything, and so people understood that they really didn't own property anymore. Uh, took away businesses, brought Castro over from Cuba. Cuba is only forty-five minutes from Jamaica, and and um, he brought with him Castro did the Russian money and started building things and multinational companies up and left Jamaica fled, and the the rich fled and the middle class fled. It, it was a terrible time. Um, and, and here's the thing. Before this prime minister came to power in the 70s, when my father came in the 60s to America, he was sending money home to my mom, you know, for me. And she said she just put it in the bank because Jamaica's money at that time was worth more than the American dollar. Think about that. Wow. And yet in just a few short years, this socialist um, almost wanting to bring us to communism uh, destroyed Jamaica. And it took 40 years for Jamaica to come up out of that. Ladies and gentlemen, again, you're listening to Lieutenant Governor Winsome Earl Sears on her must read, How Sweet It Is Defending the American Dream. Winston, I have so much to ask you in so little time. We'll get to as much as we can in our brief time here today. You are no stranger to tragedy which makes Uh your story all the more compelling, fraught with the task of overcoming great grief and yet great hope. I reference your beloved Dijon and two granddaughters. Can you explain? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, boy. Um, So you get the proverbial visit from the sheriff. Uh, In my case, it was two. And they tell you that it's a three o'clock and it's a, in the morning and, and, and they tell you that your daughter is dead, your granddaughter Faith is dead, and your other granddaughter Victoria is on life support. And what do you do? And I was standing there with my husband and my other daughter who had just run down the stairs and there was a chair there and I just dropped. I dropped in the chair and I heard myself say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And of course, that comes from Job. And, uh, I, you know, and then after that, you collapse everywhere because you're, it, it's, it's not as if they had a disease, let's say, that was going to be terminal. And so you had time to talk with them and, and, and talk about the good times and the bad times and reminisce and, and hold hands. And, you know, finally they die peacefully. No, it was a bam, sudden Sudden, suddenly they're gone. And as the Lord had said to me and, and helping me to adjust to the new normal, when I would say gone, he said, gone where? Finish the sentence. And so uh, from that moment, I would say, gone home. And then when people would say to me, uh, you've lost your family. And I repeated it that one time. Yes, I lost them. The Lord said to me, lost? Do you not know where they are? And so from then on, I said, uh, they're not lost. They're in heaven. I didn't lose them, and I'm going to join them one day. You know, the perspective they have in heaven is when are you coming, you see, because it's so much better there than it is here. And that's something else the Lord said to me when I was wondering, you know, I was trying to comfort my mom. I'd picked her up from the airport. You know, she'd come up from Jamaica, and I didn't know what to say. How would I comfort her that her— grandchild and great-grandchildren 
or gone on home to heaven. And what the what the Lord said to me as I was contemplating, well, why am I having such trouble with this when I know where they are? They're looking in God's face, you know, and it's where I want to be one day. And I thought, I know why. It's because they never had a chance at life. And as soon as I said that, the Lord said to me, a chance at life? You mean a chance to not know whether people love them for them or love them for their money? If they were to be rich, you mean a chance at not getting sickness and diseases? You mean a chance at being insulted and whatever? You know, the Lord just kept throwing things at me. And then finally he said, what do you have here on earth? that's better than heaven. And then he repeated it again. What do you have here on earth that's better than heaven? And then he went away and I thought, wow, because you see the next day was the funeral and I wasn't going to go. How do I sit in the church with three caskets, not one, not wow. two, but three caskets in front of me? It's impossible for me to do. And But when I heard that, I was so heartened. I was so heartened and I went in there and you know, we marched down the, the aisle and we were, we were pretty much dancing, remembering where they were. And it didn't mean that, you know, I didn't go through the stages of grief, and but it just eased it a bit, knowing that they're with the Lord. And one day it occurred to me, you know, these kids are having fun without me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what an amazing perspective and needed so much uh, for all of our listeners uh, today. Um, in your latest great read and memoir, How Sweet It Is. You recount the time a woman who had lived in Israel for five years came up to you in a restaurant you had frequented, uh, declaring she had a, quote, word for you. Talk about the impact yes. of that on your campaign and what happened next. Yes. So I, I walked into the restaurant and uh, as I was ordering my food, a woman uh, just came out of nowhere, never met her, never seen her. And she touched me and she said, after you finish getting your food, come, I have a word from the Lord for you. And I thought this was intriguing. And I had just announced the month before for my campaign for lieutenant governor. And you have to understand that i have been gone out of politics for 20 years. And, uh, you know, who would remember me? And so the endorsements were gone, you know, and it was difficult and the money it would be hard to raise. And here I am coming back out of nowhere. So anyway, when she said that, and I looked at my campaign manager who was with me, I thought, hmm, this is going to be intriguing. And so we sat down and she started to talk about everything that I had been doing up to that point. She could never have known unless the Lord had spoken to her. And then she started to tell me the things that I could be, I should be looking out for and what was going to happen. And when it was all done, I was so encouraged that I looked at my campaign manager and I said, start ordering, order the yard signs, order the, the, the bumper stickers, order the this, order the that. And he said, with what money? We have no money. I said, did you not hear the Lord speak? Go and order them. The money is coming. <laughs> and sure enough, the money, the money came and, and, you know, it was just so wonderful to know that now, I wasn't told I would win. And in fact, when I was asking the Lord if I should run, he never said anything about winning. It's just a matter of being obedient because whether you win or lose in the way that the world considers something a win or a loss, you must always be obedient, you see. Always be obedient to the Lord. What does he say? Uh, he says that obedience is better than sacrifice. And that's what Samuel, the man of God, told the political leader, King Saul. So here I am in politics, and to obey is always better than sacrifice. Amen and amen. A last question. You sought the Lord in prayer. This is clear. At every juncture, he answered, and I quote in part from your latest must read, quote, then I heard very clearly the Lord say, Quote, you are asking the wrong question. The question is not whether you should run, but whether you are willing to lose. Because if you are willing to lose, you can do anything. End quote. And then came your resolve. And I quote, I have the strategy. And frankly, I look like the strategy. 
I'm a woman, mm. I'm black, I'm an immigrant, I'm a veteran, I'm a small business owner. There it is. Lieutenant Governor mm. Winsome Earl Sears, your thoughts on where we are today in America, the 2024 presidential campaign, Hamas's war with Israel in our remaining time today, your hope. You know, it's so very interesting when we consider where we are. Literally, there is a powder keg happening, hopefully not, in the Middle East. And all eyes are on Israel, as it should be, because Israel just dis- dictates so much in the Bible. So much result- revolves around Israel. And I think about, for example, 1948. 1948, um, when they got their land back. And then... The Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War back then. Well, from that time until now, uh, here we are. It's 50 years later. And it was on Yom Kippur 50 years later. What has it been? Two weeks plus now that Hamas killed, massacred all those Jewish children, mothers, fathers, teenagers, and, you know, just mayhem. And, And think about it. 50 years, what does 50 mean in the Bible? It's the year of Jubilee. And what did Israel do in order to get some kind of peace with the Palestinians? Israel gave some of that land back, the Gaza. The Gaza Strip gave it to the Palestinians in hopes of peace in 2005. It didn't work. And we know that in the year of Jubilee, the land always reverts back to the original owner. That's Israel. Could that be what we're seeing today? And then, you know, I just happened to be reading Isaiah 54 and 15. And what's significant about that is Isaiah 54 had come up in two other instances by two different people, if I'm, you know, thinking about this correctly. And I thought, wait a minute, there's, this is no coincidence. And as I started to read Isaiah 54, I saw verse 15. And what does it say? Uh, paraphrasing, it says, If a nation comes to war against you, Israel, it's not because I sent them, and I will defeat them. I will fight for you. Now, you have to remember that by Isaiah 54 was written, the Jews were coming up out of captivity, and uh, the Lord was telling them to encourage them, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. And not not to, you know, think about the, what had happened in the past. And so here we are, 50 years later, and this war. And then now we are going to be having an election here in November, in, uh, November 2024. And, 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 you know, we've just got to make sure we're doing the right thing. We've got to make sure that we win. It's really that simple, that we elect righteous people. Because we want to have God's blessings. And... We have to be a praying people. We tried, if we recall, communism back in 1623. Think about that. Under Governor Bradford, when the pilgrims came aboard, the Puritans, and and they tried to do all things in common and, you know, put everything in, and, and it didn't work. The government back then, 1623, made the decision that if you don't work, you don't eat. And so it assigned land to different people in this is your land, this is your little plot, you work it, you work it, you work it. And as a result, the colony, the pilgrims were saved. Today, what we're finding is that governments want to put us into communism, whereas in 1623, the government pulled the people out of communism. So, you know, somebody once said, we learn from history that we never learn from history. Let's hope that we do learn from history and follow the Lord and do his will. Amen and amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the Honorable Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, Winsome Earl Sears, who's recently released a memoir, How Sweet It Is, Defending the American Dream, is a must and needed read, and especially now. You can learn more about Lieutenant Governor Winsome's work, ministry, and mission by visiting ltgov.virginia. Dot gov, as well as social media for all the latest. And then get her book, How Sweet It Is, at Amazon.com or wherever books 
our soul. You will be blessed, refreshed, and given great hope that nothing is impossible with God, including defending the American dream. Lieutenant Governor Winsome, if I may thank you for taking precious time to share your heart, your life, your journey, and your purpose in Christ Jesus from that six-year-old Jamaican immigrant to the halls of Congress and beyond on the battlefield and off through triumph and tragedy for our veterans, our families, our youth, and the great state of Virginia you so beautifully represent. How sweet it is, is a memoir, not just for some, but for everyone. Everyone with a dream to be more, achieve more, no matter the circumstance, color, or call. The scripture state, and I quote, If God be for us, who can be against us? What a powerful example your life has been of just that. We thank you, and God bless you. Thank you so very much, and God bless all of your listeners. Testimony is a global broadcast made possible by the generous contributions of our valued partners at Jensine Bard Ministries and you, our listening audience. Together, we are reaching souls for Christ, one testimony at a time. If you would like information on how you can support this broadcast with your tax-deductible gift, please visit us at jensinebard.com. That's one word, J-E-N-S-I-N-E-B-A-R-D dot com. And join the conversation at our Facebook page, Testimony with Jensine Bard. Thank you for listening, and please join us again for Testimony. Testimony.